All the Right Notes, the first book by Twitter influencer Lance Levine. It's a wild ride down a path of musical adventure that recaps many random run-ins with rock royalty, such as U2, Slash, The Ramones, The Goo Goo Dolls, and many more. And all the crazy occurrences that have happened to him that trace back to music. All the Right Notes is 209 pages sure to bring a smile to your face and to remind you how much music has probably touched your life as well. All the right notes available now on Amazon in paperback for fourteen ninety nine and on Kindle for all you tech warriors for nine ninety nine. Also at local Chicago bookstores, as well as Rolling Stone Records on Harlem and Irving. If you can't find it, ask for it by name. All the right notes by Lance Levine. And I have been told I could not put it down. I read it all in one day. So order it now and see what all the fuss is about. This episode is also sponsored by Manscaped.com. That's right. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code STSPOD. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped.com with promo code STSPOD. Thanks to our house band Stink Bomb for our intro music and our theme song. Uh, man, I always love to hear those guys. Stink Bomb are the best. So, welcome to the record store. We are back at the record store, and I have like I am so happy that this album got pulled out today. It is one of my all-time favorite artists, and it just so happened to be. Um, yanked out from the the giant stacks of CDs. So once again, as you know, the record store is where I randomly grab an album from my vast collection of CDs. One of these days, I'll have to get a new turntable so I can start listening to some more vinyl. I don't have a uh, a proper turntable these days. Lost that in the divorce with everything else. So anyway, but maybe one of these days I'll get a close and play record player or whatever they're called and uh, see if I can start listening to some vinyl. Some of those classic Beatles albums that I have in my basement downstairs. So anyway... The uh, the concept, as you know, the concept for the record store is, of course, where I pull a random album and just talk about my experiences with that artist, that band, uh, that singer, that performer, and just talk about that album, too, as well. So go through it track by track. Uh, and today, I happen to grab, the album is called Trouble in Shangri-La. It is Stevie Nicks. It is her sixth studio album. It came out in 2001. Uh, and if you don't already know this, you will now know it. Not that Brian loves his mama, but if you don't already know this, Stevie Nicks is my be-all and end-all. Fleetwood Mac is my be-all and end-all when it comes to music. So if I was on a desert island and I only had one band, performer, artist, whatever, it would be all the various uh, permutations of Fleetwood Mac, including Stevie Nicks. So I have been a fan of theirs since, let me see, I guess it would be about 1975, which is dating me, but, you know, age is just a number, as a great uh, singer-songwriter once said. Uh, but I've, I probably, all things, I, I mean, I, I would say definitely as a, whatever, 14-year-old teenager, I had the the major crush on Stevie Nicks because she was, you know, the beautiful blonde singer in the rock band. And, you know, every teenage boy has a crush on that kind of that kind of singer if you're into rock music. So that may or may not have been how I originally got into Fleetwood Mac. I, I can't say for sure, but I know that was definitely part of it. But, I mean, immediately I knew the music was excellent, too, because I can remember sitting there listening to Rumors and just being absolutely blown away in about 75, 76, whenever it came out, 
Um, and then going back and listening to the original Fleetwood Mac album with that lineup, with the classic Fleetwood Mac lineup with Lindsay and Stevie. Um, the other albums, you know, the seven or eight or so albums that predated them joining the band were there, and I didn't really go out of my way to get them until I became, you know, old enough where I could actually buy all these old back catalog albums and stuff. Totally different type of music. I did love the Bob Weld stuff, um, but there's, it's definitely, it was more bluesy as it started, and then it got more and more towards the rock and towards the pop stuff when uh, Lindsay and Stevie joined, but have always been my band. Um, I have seen them... Man, if you add up the various, um, you know, solo tours of Lindsay and even Christine McVie and Stevie herself, as well as Fleetwood Mac, even the Fleetwood Mac when it didn't have Lindsay and Stevie in it, um, if you add up all those various tours, I've seen them probably roughly about 50 times. Um, I've seen her at least a dozen times on various tours. I've seen Fleetwood Mac themselves well over a dozen times, probably close to 20 times. Um, and then, like I said, the various Lindsay, a lot of Lindsay tours, and even a couple of shows with Christine McVie. So, seen them bunches of times. Uh, never went home disappointed. So, this album, Trouble in Shangri-La, was, like I said, her sixth album. Went gold. Um, it's almost an hour long, and so it's one of her longer albums as far as a single album goes. Um, I feel it's very overlooked in her catalog. I feel it's very overlooked. Although it spent 20 weeks on the charts when it came out in 2001, it actually hit number five on the charts. But I feel like, you know, there were no enormous hits on this album. And so that's probably somewhat why it was kind of overlooked. And I'll get into kind of some of the other reasons why I think it was kind of overlooked in her catalog and her vast, you know, greatest hits type catalog. Um, Cheryl Crow is on here. In fact, Cheryl Crow is all over this album. This is obviously when they became friends, and she leaned on Cheryl Crow quite a bit. Sarah McLaughlin is on one of these songs. Uh, Macy Gray, there's a name you don't hear very often, <laughs> but Macy Gray is on one of the better songs on this album, too. So this album, some of the backstory was she had tried to start recording it. Uh, she had to take a break because the, the, the big machine, as Lindsay likes to call Fleetwood Mac, the big machine called because they were reuniting for the dance the live album that they put out and to do a tour there so she had to put this on hold so Trouble in Shangri-La kind of got put on the back burner it took a long time for them to finish it um, a couple other weird notes Planets of the Universe hits number one it's one of the songs on this album that we'll talk about so Planets of the Universe hits number one on the Billboard Hot Dance Music and Club Play chart which I don't know if I get that. I mean, it definitely has a really cool groove to it, and it's a really good song. As a, and we'll talk about where it stands in my list of um, my all-time favorite Stevie songs, but it's it. I don't know that it would qualify as a dance club music song, but I don't know. Maybe they did some kind of version of it. You know, they did some extended play version of it where it played in the clubs or something. So, um as you know, I love it when the lyrics are in the liner notes and the lyrics are in here, which is good because it helps me try to figure out, you know, Stevie's so mystical and spiritual and out there anyway, so having the lyrics actually helps a little bit in trying to decipher what some of these songs mean. So she wrote most of it. Uh, one song was written by a girl named Sandy Stewart who had an album or two back in the day. Uh, Cheryl Crow wrote some stuff. Uh, Every Day was the biggest hit on this album. It was a moderate hit for her, moderate radio play, uh, written by other guys altogether. Damon Johnson was the guy's name who wrote it with John Shanks, who was one of the producers of the album. So um, in the thank yous, I thought one of them that was kind of weird to see was Rosanna Arquette, actress Rosanna Arquette, who is in some really great quirky movies along with her sister Patricia um, who I love in all the Quentin Tarantino stuff uh, and the other big thank you on here is Tom Petty for inspiring her to go on uh, one of the songs and we'll get to it one of the songs is very much about Tom Petty and about how he's inspired her and so on and motivated her so we'll get to that in one of the tracks so all right so let's start out the album so the the opening track is the title track of the album Trouble in Shangri-La um, you know, I want to say, you know, whenever you hear a, 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 a love song or a breakup song from Stevie Nicks, the automatic assumption is it's about Lindsey Buckingham because that was the most high profile, um, 
relationship that she had, even though, you know, she dated, God, Don Henley, you name it. She dated all of them, Mick Fleetwood. She dated very many people. Let's just go there. Let's just leave it at that and not get into too many descriptive terms there. So, But when you hear a song about a breakup from from uh, Stevie Nicks, you automatically go, your automatic go-to is Lindsay, which may or may not be true, because like I said, she dated dozens of popular musicians. And so it could have been about him. I'm assuming it was about him. Um, this song just has very lush production. It's a really nice opener for the album. Um, it's just so smooth. It has a great groove to it. One of the lines is, um, "You used to be my love." So when you, like I said, when you used, when you hear that kind of thing from Stevie Nicks, from a Stevie Nicks, your natural assumption assumption is Lindsey Buckingham. May or may not have been. I'm going to go with it was just based on the time frame. Um, so really nice opening to the song, but again, it's about a relationship and a breakup, So, which seems to be a thread throughout this album somewhat. So, But like I said, great production, really w- nice way to open the album. So it goes immediately, there's like no even, not even a break, it just goes immediately into the second song, which is called Candle Bright. This one is one of the songs that Sheryl Crow is all over this. Um, this one is weird because it's a really old song. Um, it was written way back in the day, like in the 70s. And it seems to be about a friend with benefits. So it, for, I don't know, maybe the, that may not have been a term in the 70s, but th- she seems to be, you know, she's singing about, she's they've been together, she drifts away, they drift back together, they get back together. And then she even acknowledges in the song, she even admits that the whole thing is weird. And she's like, you know me, I'm just a nomad, you know. So this song, Candle Bright, um, it's a decent song. Uh, like I said, Sheryl Crow is all over it. Uh, there's a handful of songs on here that Sheryl Crow is just all over. Um, and just one of those songs like, oh, you, you know me, I'm Stevie Nicks, I'm a nomad, I'm a gypsy, I'm going to be all over the place, so you have to, if you want me in your life, that's the me that you have to accept. So, all right, third song is a song called Sorcerer. Uh, very much, again, a very much Sheryl Crow influenced song, very country-ish, although... Um, there's some really nice vocal gymnastics from Stevie. She hits a lot of high notes on this song. Um, the lyrics are typical mysterious Stevie, um, lady from the mountains, snow dream, (laughs) which gosh, I wonder what snow dream could have been about. Um, interesting. This song, again, another really old song. This song was actually published in 1972. So way predating the album coming out in 2001. Um, I'm guessing it was maybe as she first started getting into snow or drugs or I'm not sure. Um, but like I said, very country song, got a little bit of airplay. This one did, um, it what it really reminded me of was an eagle song. I could definitely hear like the eagles backing her doing this song or and singing harmonies with this. So it definitely had a very eaglesy vibe to it, very early eagles sound um, for Sorcerer, the third song. All right, then at number four, fourth song on the album is the highlight of the album by far, not even close. It's Planets of the Universe, the song I talked about oddly. Which was uh, number one on the dance music club playlist in 2001, which, I don't know, it's so weird. I'll have to go back and, and search the internet and see if there's actually a different version of it that um, that I can find that, that maybe explains how it got so popular in the clubs back in the day. So this song is, I will say, it is in my team photo of my favorite Stevie song. It is... Um, it's just incredible. It's it's just such an incredible song. It has such a great build to it. Um, again, it's an older song. It was written in 1979. Um, so it predates this album coming out by, man, 20 years. And it was a, it was a song that I'm guessing that, like I said, publication date was 79. So I don't think it was written for rumors um, and didn't make the cut because that was a couple years after Rumors came out. So my guess is that it was written for Tusk and didn't make the cut. Um, And actually, Stevie's songs on Tusk are all superb. So I I guess they could have possibly squeezed it in. It was a double album, so there was room. (laughs) But Or maybe it could have been a B-side on some of the, um, the singles from Tusk. But it definitely fits in with Tusk, and it fits in from that era of Stevie. Um, from like the Sisters of the Moon and the Storms era of Stevie on Tusk. 
Um, and honestly, like I said, it is one of my favorite songs of hers. You Catch Me on the Right Day and Planets of the Universe is my favorite Stevie Nicks song. So it's got this great, really nice acoustic start, and then it just turns into this major groove, which it has like this chilling chorus that like honestly to this day you know whatever it is 20 years later it still sends a shiver up my spine listening to the chorus of planets in the universe it's such a great song for all the airplay that stand back and edge of 17 and other classic you know well-known stevie songs get this this song really honestly i think this song should be in the team photo with those because it's just spectacular so i think I've heard different interpretations, but I, my take on it is it's about how inconsequential we all are with respect to the planets and the sun, including her and the guy that she's pissed off at, you know, so there's always a guy that she's pissed off at, you know, whether it's always Lindsay Buckingham or if it was Don Henley at one point or whoever the case may be, her ex-husband, um, I think they parted on good terms, so I don't think she probably is pissed off at him, but whoever she's pissed off about when she's writing this song, I think... She's singing about how inconsequential all that bullshit is in light of the planets of the universe and, like I said, the sun and the moon. So it's just this magnificent, haunting song. Um, Just everything about it is just perfect. Just perfect production. Um, Like I said, I, I, I mean, it does have a great groove to it. It does have a great... Like the the music is so great to it, but I just I'm not sure how it <laughs> it got on those those uh, club charts. So whatever. Either way. Classic song should be in the uh, the Mount Rushmore of Stevie Nicks songs for sure. So, all right, number five was a song called Every Day. That was a song I talked about earlier that two other guys wrote, one of the guys that produced the album. She did not write it, but this is the one that actually got some airplay. It wasn't a huge hit, but it got some airplay. Uh, it's just a beautiful pop song, a love song, just a really simple song, very spare lyrics, but just so effective and so infectious. Um there's strings on it, which I don't think are actually strings. I think it's probably just synthesizer or keyboards or whatever, but it adds a really nice touch to it. Um, and Every Day, I think, has become something of a staple in her playlist, in her set list when she tours. So, like I said, probably the the about the only song from this album, other than us hardcores that know Planets of the Universe, um, probably the only song that got some radio airplay back in the day. So, all right, number six is a song called Too Far From Texas, um, 100% pure country. (laughs) Natalie Maines duets with her on this. That's one of the women from the Dixie Chicks, which I don't know if I'm allowed to say the Dixie Chicks anymore because of, you know, Snowflake era. Um, but that group, you know, those three blonde girls that sing country, whatever they're called, the chicks or whatever their names are these days so that they don't get in trouble. So, but this is a pure country song. Um, again, it's about a woman who's missing her man. He's on the road. She's afraid that he's not going to come home and not going to return to her. Uh, this again, written by somebody else, written by Sandy Stewart, who you have no idea who Sandy Stewart is. Um, she had an album that I recall. I have it again. It's probably downstairs in my my basement on vinyl because it doesn't as far as i know it does not even exist in cd because it was 70s late 70s maybe um the album was called cat dances and it was or cat dancing one or the other and it was really good i really enjoyed it but again now that i don't have a turntable i can't even listen to it so and it doesn't exist on cd so anyway sandy stewart wrote this song this too far from texas song And I never associated Sandy Stewart with country, but this song is totally country. And not to diss on country, it's just traditionally not my thing. I'll deal with it when Stevie Nicks veers that route, but not one of my higher songs on the album because I'm not... I mean, Natalie Maines is there. She's a singer. She happens to be on this song. Um, So it's just kind of there. If you're a country fan, you might like it. But I, I will say this. I could definitely hear this on a country top 40 radio station for sure. So it's a great song if you're into that kind of genre, that kind of music. I'm traditionally not, but it is a good song regardless. So, all right, we're going to take a brief intermission, as we are now calling it when we take a break, thanking our sponsors so that I can continue to eat some ramen and dinty more stew. And we'll be right back with side two of Trouble in Shangri-La. We'll be right back. This episode is also brought to you by SpunkLoop.com. Remember when you're getting funky like a monkey, you know. 
know what I mean. You spunky, that's right. Go to www.spunkloop.com and tell them STS Pod sent you. Oh, you didn't know? Well, your ass better... Well, you better tell someone. Tell someone about stspod.com. Tell them now. Call them. Text them. Tell them. Telegram. Send them video messages. Whatever. Tell them. All the Right Notes, the first book by Twitter influencer Lance Levine. It's a wild ride down a path of musical adventure that recaps many random run-ins with rock royalty, such as U2, Slash, The Ramones, The Goo Goo Dolls, and many more. And all the crazy occurrences that have happened to him that trace back to music. All the Right Notes is 209 pages sure to bring a smile to your face and to remind you how much music has probably touched your life as well. All the right notes available now on Amazon in paperback for fourteen ninety nine and on Kindle for all you tech warriors for nine ninety nine. Also at local Chicago bookstores, as well as Rolling Stone Records on Harlem and Irving. If you can't find it, ask for it by name. All the right notes by Lance Levine. And I have been told I could not put it down. I read it all in one day. So order it now and see what all the fuss is about. All right, we're back from break. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, I will be able to continue to eat at this point. Hot dogs from 7-Eleven, that is my go-to. Uh, or possibly, uh, actually, you know what? The chicken sandwich at Popeye's. That's been getting a lot of my attention lately. So thank you for our sponsors for keeping me in the chicken sandwiches. So appreciate that. So back to um, our album for the week. It is Trouble in Shangri-La by Stevie Nicks, her sixth studio album, her sixth proper studio album, because there were... There was a, uh, a Greatest Hits package or two that came out at some point in that midst of all that. Um, but this one is from 2001. Hard to believe that that was 20 years ago. Um, it still sounds as alive and as, uh, you know, it still works today, 20 years later. It's really weird when you look back at those albums. Like, you know, for instance, like Fle- like uh, Rumors, for instance, you know, 1976. And it's like, man, when you think about it, that is 40, over 40 years ago. It's hard to believe that those albums still hold up and they're still as, as vibrant and alive and they don't sound as dated as like when you hear stuff from like the 30s and 40s, you know, compared to today. Just amazing. So anyway, this album, like I said, she had taken a seven year break uh, between solo albums um, with the dance worked in, uh, working with Fleetwood Mac, doing some touring there and just her her own issues that she had going on. So finally, after a seven year hiatus, she came out with this album in 2001. So all right. So back to the, the track list. So at number seven, the song is called That Made Me Stronger. This is the song that is completely 100% about Tom Petty. Um, the story goes that she was wanting, she she lost her confidence in her music and in her writing and in herself. And she was leaning on Tom and she wanted Tom Petty to write the music for her. And Tom believed in her and told her, absolutely not. I will not do it for you. You do it yourself. But he meant it in more of a motivational way. So it wasn't like Tom was just saying, F you, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. You know, quit leaning on It wasn't at all like that. It was more so Tom knew what she had within her and the drugs had fucked her up or, you know, the, the uncertainty, the various things that were going on in her life, her marriage, her divorce, uh, the whole situation politically with Fleetwood Mac and and so on. So she had lost confidence in herself and he managed to restore it. And this song is kind of her homage to him in the sense that she was thanking him for making her stronger. Hence the name of the song that made me stronger. Um, You know, you would think with that backstory, you would think that the music would be heartbreakers ish, but it's not at all. It's just, it's kind of prototypical Stevie Nicks. It's not at all heartbreakers. It's not Tom Petty ish. Um, and like I said, she's basically thanking him for getting her to believe in herself once again. So once you know that, and once you deduce that from the lyrics and the fact that she thanked him 
over the top, she thanked him in the liner notes for um, inspiring her. It's a really sweet story once you figure out the backstory to the song. So I really love that song, knowing that that's the deal with that song. You know, the song in and of itself is okay, but knowing that that's the, the what's behind the, the lyrics is really important and meaningful and impactful. So I really love that song. So, all right, eighth song is called It's Only Love. 100% a Sheryl Crow song. It's a, just a very short, simple song, hardly any lyrics. What struck me listening to it now, there's a handful of songs on here that I just literally did not remember because they don't um, they don't get airplay. Um, they are second side of the album type of tracks that, you know, they don't really stand out, and this is one of them. But what really stood out to me on this one it was very Beatles-ish. With, if you listen to it, it was very Beatles-ish, even though, like I said, you don't necessarily think of Sheryl Crow and the Beatles in the same breath. But what it reminded me of was Norwegian Wood. It was just a simple guitar, acoustic guitar, and vocal. And, and very much like a Norwegian Wood. If you listen to it back-to-back with Norwegian Wood from that era of the Beatles, that's very much what this song reminded me of. So, like I said, just a short, simple, harmless song. Um, it just shows how much she was leaning on Sheryl Crow for support and friendship at the time when this album was put together. So, all right, ninth song, song is called Love Changes. Um, yet another Love Gone Wrong song. So it's another tale. Um, this time, and again, like I said, for better or worse, you always associate these types of songs with Lindsey Buckingham. So, But I will tell you, having read numerous, multiple biographies of Stevie Nicks, that there were other men in her life, many other men in her life. Never me, sadly, but anyway, that's another story for another day. From that day when I first got the crush on her in the 70s. So, But anyway... Um, so this song, you know, it's another, like I said, it's another love song gone wrong. Uh, I did and did and did for you and it was never good enough. So now I have to walk away that kind of, that kind of sentiment. So it has like kind of a cool groove to it actually with just very simple drumming and keyboards. It has a very nineties ish feel to it. Um, but a a good song, um, but I wish, you know, you could figure out who is she talking about. Because, like I said, I feel bad for firing these shots at Lindsay every damn time, and it's not, obviously, they can't all be about him. I mean, they were together for a long time, but they weren't together forever. So, Love Changes, good song at number nine. Then, of course, we have to completely flip the page on the tenth song, which is called I Miss You, which is completely the opposite of the last song. So, this song is... It, it it's so confusing because she realizes in I Miss You, she realizes through all of their ups and downs that she actually misses him and the good outweighed the bad. So it's a really poignant song. Um, and again, this is a positive song, a positive love song. And you, again, you want to think, is it Lindsay? Could it have been? This one I think for sure has to be about Lindsay. So I will put my money on this one being about Lindsay because she even has him playing on this song. So he's even playing guitar on this song. So I don't think you bring him in you know, as a special guest to play on one song on the album and have it be this song and have it not be about him. It's just about, you know, some fictitious love story or whatever, or about somebody else altogether. So it is a nice sentiment. Like I said, she realizes through all the ups and downs that the very, the very good times that they had and the very much success that they had in their careers way outweighs the bad that they had, which there was bad for sure. Having read the books, there was definitely bad, but at the end of the day, they finally always come back together to, to cash the paychecks so and to make the music. I, I, I laugh about the paycheck part, but to make the music because it is my all-time favorite band and my all-time favorite music. And you know what? The angst and the animosity and the heartbreak and all the other ups and downs with those people is what made such fantastic music. So, again, a really poignant song. Um, really did like I Miss You at number 10. So, 11, I am so super confused, have no idea what it's about, and I'll be the first to admit it, even with the lyrics on the liner notes. It's called Bombay, Bombay Sapphire. Bombay, ugh, I'm going to screw this up six times. Bombay Sapphires, plural. So, the first thing you think of when you hear that name is gin. You know, I'm thinking, I'm a gin drinker. I like gin and tonic. So, Bombay Sapphire is a gin. 
Uh, so I'm thinking, is this about gin? What the frick is this about? So this is the song that Macy Gray sings on. You really wouldn't be able to tell if it wasn't on the um, the credits. So it has a really nice groove, really nice beat. It's a very mysterious song. She talks about the seas. She talks about colors. Uh, it's a very mellow, like, steely Dan, if I can just try to grab another sound. This has, like, a very steely Dan kind of jazzy groove to it. So... Um, but I have no idea what it's about. So my my only theory, and I'm completely, I'm sure I'm completely off base here, is that the Sa- Bombay Sapphire Gin comes in a blue bottle. She does talk about blue in the song, the color blue, but she talks about purple and turquoise and other colors too. So all I can come up with, and I'm completely, I'm sure I'm completely off on this, is that it's the booze singing to her, the gin is singing to her, that'll take her all away from all of her problems. So otherwise, I don't know, why not name this song, you know, Stolich Naya or Smirnoff or, you know, whatever, Myers Rum, or whatever she was drinking at the time. So all I think of is that Bombay Sapphire was going to take her away like Calgon, take me away. So at number 11, good song, but no idea what it's about. So, all right, 12th song, Fall From Grace. It is the only rocker on this album. Um, Planets of the Universe is kind of a rocker, but it's a kind of moody, mysterious song, haunting, whereas Fall From Grace is a flat-out rock song. Um, It is the only flat-out rock song on this album. By this point, you know, you're 12 songs in on a 13-track album. It's refreshing to hear Stevie rocking her ass off on this song. So this seems like it's her acknowledgement of how she feels to be the other woman in a, in a, in a love triangle. That's how it seemed to me. You know, I'm following the lyrics and just hearing how she's singing it. She says him quite a bit. Um, and it just, it came across like it was her acknowledging how it feels to be the other woman in the, you know, in a marriage that's crumbling. So the marriage eventually ends and now they're all alone. All three of them are now alone. And so I, That's how I interpreted it. Um, There are people that interpret it to be her relationship with Fleetwood Mac, as far as like her being the outsider looking in on the band, and the band was starting to unravel at that point before she had left for a time. Um, But I don't know. It could be both. You know, Stevie has written songs before about different topics and blended them together, so it could be that. But I, like I said, for me, hearing the pronoun him so often throughout the song made me think that it was about her, you know, acknowledging that how it feels to be the mistress in a situation. So the other line that stood out on the other side of it is all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put us back together again type of thing, Um, which that's where I think the Fleetwood Mac interpretation is that, you know, the band was starting to go south and they were starting to all go their separate ways and whatever forces were going to come together, they weren't going to be enough to put Fleetwood Mac together again. So although they did come together for the dance and they've come together since then. So I don't know, but I'm going to stick with my, my gut on that one in that it was, especially knowing that Stevie has been in so many relationships and in so many different, uh, different entanglements with, with gentlemen, shall we say that I'm going to stick with that. And I think that is where, um, the interpretation of fall from grace is. So, and then of course we wrap it up 13th song after all of that angst, after all of that, you know, heartache and misery and you screwed me over and I'm walking away and all these various themes throughout this album. The album ends with a song called love is, which is of course this beautiful love song. Um, it's an epic closer, which seems to be, she started like very early on in her solo career. She started closing the albums with just, just these epic songs. Um, as opposed to just throwing it in the middle of the song or starting the album with it. So it's always a very um, majestic song to close out the album. And that's the the song on this album is Love Is. It has a very, actually, it has a very Christine McVie sound to it. Um, The harmonies are gorgeous. Christine McVie has always been one of my absolute favorite singers um, in terms of pure vocal. Alicia Keys and Christine McVie are my two favorite singers as far as pure voice, beauty of their voices. Um, and this song has those harmonies from from Stevie and her backup singers on this. So it is, you know, the more I listened to it, I had to go back and listen to it a second time. It is a Fleetwood Mac song. This song is definitely a Fleetwood Mac song. Um, 
publishing date on this was 1995. So I'm thinking, you know, this could have been, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, it could have been intended for a Fleetwood Mac song and it just never made the cut. Um, or she just said, screw it. You know, we can reproduce what Fleetwood Mac does in the studio with the guitar and the keyboard and the production elements and the harmonies because the harmonies are the biggest part of it. Um, but it is 100% a Fleetwood Mac song, which is probably one of the reasons why it's actually one of the best songs on the album. It's a beautiful, like I said, beautiful love song after all of that heartache and sorrow and everything else that she sings about and being a gypsy and a nomad and all over the place she ends it with this beautiful love song and it's just really great way to end the album so that is it that is trouble in shangri-la so overall what i will say about it is it's a good album but it's not great it's probably towards the bottom of my my um my stevie albums although what i will say is a lower-ranked Stevie Nicks album is better than just about anything else out there because Stevie is just such an incredible artist and singer and performer. So I would have liked more rocking Stevie. I thought that that is probably one of the reasons why this album is kind of overlooked in her catalog um, because there was too much country. It was too much, and not, not dissing on country, but it's just not her thing, you know. I mean, it should be more straight-ahead rock and roll like Tusk type stuff um, and like Belladonna and her earlier work. So I enjoyed this album, but it's definitely, if you're going to rank them from one to six for those first six albums, this would probably be number six. So um, it's, but, it, but on the flip side of that, it's hard to diss an album that has planets of the universe on it. So that is a huge pull up as far as the the quality of this album is the fact that planets of the universe one of her all-time greatest songs is on this album so i enjoyed going back and listening to it like i said this is from 20 years ago i probably haven't listened to it start to finish in close to 20 years so it was cool hearing it again and hearing how some of these songs just still resonate to this day so really good um Select tracks on it, I would say, are worth going back and listening to. Um, and then there's those couple songs in the middle that are just like kind of there, kind of filler for a Stevie Nicks album. So anyway, thank you guys so much for listening to The Record Store. We will be back in a couple weeks. Thank you, Brian Trammell, for producing this and putting it all together. Thanks once again to Stink Bomb, our house band, for the theme song. And we'll be taking another trip to the record store in just a couple weeks. Be sure to join us. Tell all your friends. Spread this. Share it. Uh, retweet it. Whatever. However you do your social media and however you do your podcast listening. Go back and listen to some of the older shows. And don't forget, I have fun everywhere I go. All the Right Notes, the first book by Twitter influencer Lance Levine. It's a wild ride down a path of musical adventure that recaps many random run-ins with rock royalty, such as U2, Slash, The Ramones, The Goo Goo Dolls, and many more. And all the crazy occurrences that have happened to him that trace back to music. All the Right Notes is 209 pages sure to bring a smile to your face and to remind you how much music has probably touched your life as well. All the Right Notes, available now on Amazon in paperback for $14.99 and on Kindle for all you tech warriors for $9.99. Also at local Chicago bookstores, as well as Rolling Stone Records on Harlem and Irving. If you can't find it, ask for it by name. All the Right Notes by Lance Levine. And I have been told I could not put it down. I read it all in one day. So order it now and see what all the fuss is about. Did you enjoy that episode? Cash App us. That's right. Dollar sign B T S T S. Cash App us. One dollar, two dollars. If you cash App us over twelve dollars, I'll give you one year of Patreon for free. Graphic design is very important. Your logo is the first image potential customers see. What kind of impression would you want to make today? Need a podcast logo or a t-shirt design? KT does art. Her name has become synonymous with quality and professionalism in the graphic design community. She specializes in graphic design, painting, and more. She provides affordable commissions and professional quality with a timely delivery. Contact KT via email at KT underscore does art at yahoo.com. Check out her Instagram at Instagram.com slash KT underscore does art.
Hey, that was another great episode of Shooting the Shiznit. We're currently looking for contestants for who wants to be the best Shiznit or ever championship 2021. A shout out to our sponsors this month. And also, we have Patreon. It is only $1 at www.patreon.com slash shooting the shiznit without a G. A big thank you and a shout out to Bob McGee at Pro Wrestling, Between the Sheets, and Gene Jackson at localstolegends.com. You can reach us on Twitter at comicbookmarkbt, Instagram BT shooting the shiznit without a G, Facebook shooting the shiznit with a G, and we're also at Cool Kids Wrestling and MMA Talk. You gotta ask to get in. If we don't like you, we'll kick you out. That's right. And you can get all the archives to all the episodes at www.stspod.club. All right, let's do a roll call of my favorite podcast. So my favorite non-wrestling podcast would be Who's Right Podcast, Poor Boys Podcast, The Official Podcast, Man Brain Podcast, My Favorite Murder Podcast, I Am Fat Podcast, and my buddies over there, Richard Josh at P3 Radio. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Remember, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars.